and uh, this is a special my first special video feed for patreon um, i'm going to read the uh memories that i wrote a while ago about my night booking the famous gonzo journalist hunter thompson Long ago and far away, or at least in Florida, I was a field producer for the worst program on television. Many programs have vied for this title, and yes, there are quite a number that come pretty close, but ABC's The Last Word was the hands-down winner. They had to retire the Morton Downey Cup after that year and replace it with the Jerry Springer and Dr. Phil dual memorial ball gag. I said I was a field producer for the last word. In fact, I was the only field producer east of the Mississippi. Peter Shaplin, with his suave good looks and smooth continental manner, covered everything from the Pacific to Chicago. The reason that there were only two of us to produce material for five, five shows a week was the result of the same complete failure of planning or arguably an absence of any indications of rational thought on the part of crack production team who had created the program. You see, this was in the good old days of television known as the feudal period or the daimyo dynasty. All television programs and all television producers had been divided into fiefdoms run by a small group of powerful men there might have been a woman or two later, but I was never in their entourage. As a mid-level samurai seeking new guests, as a mid-level samurai seeking new quests after the 1980 presidential campaign and the usual complete emotional breakdown that followed, I was a loyal member of the family L. All names have been replaced by easily recognizable letters to protect, well, to protect me. That meant that L would seek to protect and keep me employed, and in turn, I would work 18 hours a day for him and periodically permit him to exercise the droit de seigneur with new interns. I'm kidding about that. Without this protective relationship, I would have had to become a ronin, a masterless samurai or freelancer, wandering the television wastelands without meaning, regular pay, or health benefits. Usually, this was an exquisitely functional relationship. Of course, my fortune rose and fell along with L's as he fought for power against Clan G, the protectivate of W, and his royal doofus Lord K. This was in the period before the rise of the gray eminence of the desk, Lady M.M., and the destruction of the feudal system and all the lords and vassals. Yes, you may ask, what the purpose of this digression you could really you really could ask that the purpose of this digression into the politics of television rest assured that it was central to the ineffable awfulness of the last word originally the sun god whose red and shiny visage had brought light and heat and ratings into abc had assigned l to produce a program to follow nightline High Protector W. rose in wrath and strode to the head office, demanding that the glory of a new program was rightfully his. His petition was heard by the Sun King. It was a bit odd how well L. bowed to the inevitable and handed over the reins of executive producer to the usurper. Good Lord, I can't write like this much longer. Hang in there. So the last word was given to W, who immediately realized why it had come to him so easily. It was a dog. W instantly took on a new tactic, wandering the halls of, Fort, of ABC at 47 West 66th Street with his eyes on the sky. If asked about the last word, he would usually respond with a vague but insightful, huh? And then quickly changed the subject to how well Barbara Walters was looking today. I believe his plan was to be so distant from the program that he could successfully pass it off as the product of another corporate division and possibly another network. The end result was that this small program was graced with four senior producers, two appointed by L and two by W. 
a director who was also a senior producer, which meant that he wouldn't listen to any of the other senior producers. One anchor in New York, a correspondent who was famous for being recovered from Woodstock after five days lost in the crowd, despite desperate efforts by his staff to ensure he stayed there, even if it meant extending the concert. I'm kidding on that one as well. And one anchor in Chicago who came with his own senior producer. That makes uh, uh, six. And an adamant determination to do nothing except his daytime program with different colors on the set. It would have worked out much better if the senior producers had followed the time hallowed CBS method of sharks in the tank and destroyed each other in true Highlander fashion. There must only be one. At the point when there was only one, the show might have had a central focus. It might have been enough if you could that you could have described it as anything but the terrible 30 minutes that follows Nightline. Sadly, the seniors, all of whom were best friends of mine, were insufficiently vicious and agreed to take turns producing one program a week. A typical week under this arrangement went like this. Uh, one, a Nightline knockoff without an anchor with Ted's ability to pay the slightest attention to research. Two, a left-wing investigation of an outrage, the outrage du jour. A Hollywood three, a Hollywood Tonight interview of a B-list celebrity. The A-list agents had standing offers to refuse all core calls from us. A news of the weird program that was always defined by someone's stating, statement in a meeting that began with, with wouldn't it be cool if programs that dis begin this way are never cool or interesting? A Friday night mashup of the previous four programs. Of course, the guy in Chicago would spend the second half of each hour walking around his studio audience. I think he went to the effort to ask them to wear ties for an evening program, but the subjects never changed. With so many senior producers, there was no money left in the budget to pay for field producers to actually do the work. So Peter and I picked up a whole bunch of blenders and stereos, which were what you got in those days before mileage awards flying back and forth across the country, doing stories on the meaning of dreams, women who killed their boyfriends, Henry Kissinger and the crisis in, Central, in Eastern Europe, the subjugation of the working class, etc. None of the senior producers dared to leave New York for fear that the music would stop and they'd be left without a chair, and all the junior staff had been chosen from the ranks of those suggested by their previous programs, uh, which meant the people you can't quite fire but sure don't want to have around. To make a short story even longer, it came tumbling down a year after a year of torture and the careers of all the seniors were effectively over at ABC News. There were a couple of lovely moments at the end. The New York anchor walked in with a substitute program that he developed at an outside studio and which meant that all the staff would have been canned. And W, in, who was ostensibly in charge of the program, simply disappeared. I'm still waiting for him to tell me that I might want to look for another position. Finally, one of the brighter young producers called me in panic the last day the show was being aired and asked me, what should he do? I said, well, tomorrow I'll go into the office, walk down to the guy who runs the assignment desk, sit, sit down and, and say, okay, boss, that's over. What do I do now? Of course, the desk chief had nothing to do with hiring or employing this guy, but as I figured, he didn't seem to want ignorant of who was on his staff and kept the kid busy all over the world for several years. Oh, and when I was young, I was able to play the great game of office politics. Too bad I've lost that skill. Well, returning to Hunter Thompson, we had decided in our dysfunctional and Sybil-esque manner to do a show on the Pulitzer trial in Palm Beach, Florida. This was one of those smarmy divorce affairs that involved multiple, multiple affairs, of course, an heiress, someone related to what I think was the Kleenex fortune, and allegations of extracurricular relations with the family Dobermans. Yeah, seriously, that's what it was. Look it up. 
Hunter Thompson, just back from several months in Hawaii, writing four pages of a book with Ralph Steadman, had been persuaded by the ever-optimistic Jan Wenner to write something, anything, and had chosen this particular Circus of the Damned. I have no idea how I knew this, but I did, and even more surprising, was able to track the gunzo journalist down to a seedy motel, or as seedy a motel as you can find in Palm Beach. I flew to Miami, ritually kissed, kissed the ring of El Jefe of the Miami Bureau, and set up a live interview in a local bar. This was because W had ordered that we do the interviews in more interesting locations that fit the people we were interviewing. As soon as I called in and said that we prepared a pop popular disco for the night, he ordered, however, okay, but don't make it look like a bar. All right. I drove up to Palm Beach and located Hunter. He'd completely forgotten that he'd agreed to do the interview, and to be honest, I'm not entirely sure he ever understood what I was asking when he agreed to do it in the first place. However, with incredibly bad grace, he prepared for the three-hour trip to Miami with a 12-pack of Heineken's on ice, a bottle of pinch, a reasonable, num a reasonable number of doobies, and a small amount of Peruvian marching powder. The process of choosing the proper chemicals for the trip and ensuring that they were at the proper temperature took a long time, so much that I was staring at the deadline of a live program right between the eyes by the time we pulled out of Palm Beach. Being young and pretty stupid at that point, I headed for Miami at speeds well over triple digits. I'll admit I'm an innocent. The only time I was ever offered cocaine was on my birthday, and I exhaled instead of inhaling and had people picking small chunks off my sweater the rest of the night. So when Hunter began to snort lines off the car dashboard, I was a bit concerned. I think I even slowed to 90 miles per hour for a while. However, airtime was everything to me back then, and I soon picked the speed back up. I had to make air. Sadly, the inhalation of blow did not have a salubrious effect on Mr. Thompson. He began to insist that I had promised him more cocaine in return for his doing the interview and grew increasingly annoyed when I insisted that I had no clue where to even get any. His feeling was that the primary job of a producer, I think he was more used to Hollywood producers, was to come up with ounces of the required product. In fact, that was the primary job of many producers, television producers in New York, and resulted in an unnaturally large percentage of staffers who were in Narcotics Anonymous in later years. But it had never been one of my duties on either the Ted Kennedy or Ronald Reagan campaigns, which were my previous field assignments. Well, I got to hear the phrases lying weasel and vicious swine many times, as well as many of Hunter's other well-known aspersions. I have to admit that it felt good to be part of a long and proud literary tra tradition of abuse and invective. I finally slid into Miami about 10 minutes to air to find that El Jefe had put together a wonderful inter interview position in a bar and lit it so that it did not look like a bar. Two rounds of free drinks got the customers to agree to shut up when we went to air. As Hunter was sitting down and being made up, he was still insisting that I would have his product ready when he finished. I called the limo company and had them bring a car and driver, transferred the sad remnants of the beer, booze, and whatever to the limo, and told the driver to take Mr. Thompson wherever he wanted. And I changed hotels just in case. I guess I knew the interview wasn't going to work out. Work. <laughs> I guess I knew the interview wasn't going to work out very well when both the director and executive producer announced they had no idea who Hunter Thompson was. Luckily, the Woodstock correspondent, who was anchoring, had met him in a former life. I think he rode motorcycles with him back in the uh, Hell's Angels days, and was able to convince them to put him on the air. As I remember, Hunter's part of the conversation lasted exactly two questions. On the first, he said that the trial was, quote, the bill coming due for the excesses of previous decades. 
which was a brilliant summing up of the story. The guy still had a couple of brain cells working in there. It was when he answered the second question with, well, Greg, I'm really interested in the bestiality aspect. Remember those Dobermans? That things went to pieces. I could hear W screaming in the control room that they were never going to take Miami again. So I made my escape before Hunter got out of the chair. I stayed overnight in an anonymous hotel room and spent 30 minutes checking out the passenger side of the rental car before I turned it in, fearing uh, a, phrase, some, a call like, uh, Mr. Irving, when we were cleaning your Ford Taurus, and I do hope you enjoyed the car, we found a strange substance tucked up deep under the carpet. I have Sergeant Garcia from Miami PD here, and uh, that was in my imagination. It didn't happen. I later found out that after searching for me in a blizzard of curses and then drinking from a good deal of the night at the bar that was not to look like a bar, Hunter had taken the limo to Atlanta and produce no doubt of his outs. Perhaps it was lucky that the program tanked only weeks later and I was able to grab on to the Nightline lifeboat. I remember Hunter fondly, if with a certain amount of healthy fear, Working with him turned out to be great practice for working with Don Imus, but that's a story for another day. Thank you for watching, if you watched. Um, this is Terry Irving. I'm Terry Irving, and thank you very much for being a patron. And we're going to have a lot more things like this in the future.